You know, a lot of people think that's a joke, but it isn't. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is sweet. He is wholesome. He is wonderful. It is the devil that raises hob, not the Lord. It's the devil that brings sickness, not the Lord. It's the devil that brings death, not the Lord. The Lord is light and healing and health, and He's good. Let's tell men and women, I know the Lord is good. Amen? Shall we pray? Dear Lord, make me a nail upon the wall to show Your picture of joy and happiness and health. And we thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. Ring around Father's grave. Jesus is coming again. My, for how many decades we've been teaching it. Peter taught it. Peter taught we're living in the last days. The Apostle Paul taught it. God wants His people always to think in terms of Jesus coming soon. The Bible says so. It's all through the New Testament. Don't get the impression that God is forgotten. God is coming, and the signs that we had when I was a boy have multiplied by the thousands. And Jesus is soon coming, and God's people are getting ready, ready to be sealed, eternally sealed, so we can go through that great time of trouble without an intercessor. Oh, so many people are scared about the time when we'll be without an intercessor. I was telling young people this afternoon, you don't have to worry about that time when there's no intercessor because Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your need. If during that time I needed an intercessor, I'd have one. But God's true, obedient children will not need one then. My God shall supply all your need. We will need a comforter, and He'll be a comforter. We'll need a guide, and He'll be a guide. We'll need a protector, and He'll be a protector. We need a, one who will strengthen us, and He'll strengthen us. We need one who will give us His continued hope, and He'll do it in His love. But we shall not need an intercessor if now we've yielded our lives to Him, if we're walking with Him now, if we're acquainted with Him now. Acquaint now thyself with Him and be at peace. My friends, the devil would like to have us get bogged down regarding the days ahead. But the Lord Jesus said, when these things shall come to pass, look up and lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh, not your destruction. We trust the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We say, Lord, though my sins be as scarlet, You have made them white as snow through the precious blood of Jesus. As the waitress was listening in that restaurant to a Christian minister who was telling her of the way of life. Oh, she said, I see. She said, Christ's red blood over my red sin makes it white as snow. And that's the Bible. That's the gospel. It's good news, beloved. Let's go out and let the world know we have good news. Rise, shine, thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Darkness shall cover the earth. Gross darkness of people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee. His glory shall be seen upon thee. Brother, sister... May God help you and me to go and let the world know we found a good Savior. Let them know that God loves us and He loves them. Let's not grope, be groping around saying, I don't know. I'm afraid. Perfect love casteth out fear. 1 John 4, 17. Let's just tell the Lord we love Him. Tell Him He loves us. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 10. Take our hour with the Lord. Get out and determine to share His love. Oh, so many people have the impression that they should go out and share doctrines, doctrines, doctrines. The greatest doctrine in the world is the love of Jesus Christ. That is doctrine. And there's no doctrine in the Bible that has a right to preclude that beautiful picture of a God of love. Tell your boys and girls, God loves you. He loves you when you're naughty. I know it because He loved me when I'm naughty. He loves you when you're a sinner. I know it because He loves me when I sin. Let the boys and no girls know that God is love so they'll not be frightened like cattle and figure the only way to find peace is to go on to LSD. The way of peace is Jesus. 
in His beauty, in His loveliness, in His grandeur, in His winsomeness. Let's share His winsomeness, beloved. Let's get out of this rot of negatives and negatives that would scare people until they're frightened. And you know that frightens people. And when people are frightened, they freeze. They conducted an experiment some time ago. The difference between the fear complex, scary complex, and the purely scientific method. They used dental hygiene on two groups. One group, to one group they give all gruesome pictures of gums that were decaying. And all of that, to the other group they gave scientific, positive principles of dental hygiene. After a long period of time, they checked on the two groups. They found that those that had attended the negative method of that group, not one, had improved. Fear has torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect. He freezes in fear, in this scary fear. There's a reverential fear. For men to grow in grace, they must grow in the atmosphere of a God that loves. Let's tell them that God loves. Will we do it? How many agree? Let's see your hands. Let's pray earnestly to do that. Now, Jesus is coming again. He's not coming for the purpose of hurting people. He's coming for the purpose of taking us to glory land. You know why he said he's coming again? In John, the 17th chapter and the 24th verse, he was praying to his father and he said, Father... I will that they whom thou hast given me be with me, that they may behold my glory. His glory is his character. His character is love. He wants us through the eternal ages to grow and grow in our, in our ability to love and to know him. And to know him is eternal life. He said, I want them to see my glory. You know, it will be a glory. When he comes again, think of the glory of identity. It's a wonderful glory. Acts 1, 10, 11 says, As he was taken up, two men stood by him in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up in heaven? The idea, what are you worried about? This same Jesus that is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner. The same Jesus! Not another. Oh, friends, the same Jesus will come again with the print of the nails in his hand, the same lovely voice, the same Christ. Some time ago over in San Francisco, there's a false Christ, a lot of them now. And there he was blessing the children, having that sweet melodious voice, but he wasn't Christ. Just about the time the air was ready to be rent by the cry, Christ has come, the little old Salvation Army came down the street singing, I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his and somebody caught the thought. He said, Jesus, show us your hands. He didn't have any nail prints. He skedaddled, skedaddled down one avenue, down another street, down the, and it was gone. I will know him. He's the same Jesus. Oh, what a day that will be. On whose breast we can lean and relax and trust. Oh, to trust him now. The same Jesus. That's a glorious thing. Second glory is the glory of association, Matthew twenty-five thirty-one. He'll come in His own glory, the glory of all the holy angels, the glory of His... What about that? The association? Every angel with Him. Can't you imagine the guardian angel will say, all those guardian angels, Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm going now, down to get my children. And the guardian angels will say something like this, I believe. May we go with you? We've been guarding this person and this person and this person, and they've given their lives to you. We want to go and catch them up. In this glorious hour, yes, you may go with me. And every angel has to go because every angel has somebody to pick up. Won't that be a glorious day? The glory of association. The glory of the glory. Matthew 24, 27. The glory of the glory. As the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west. My, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What a day that will be, won't it? Open, glorious. There's no such thing as the sea secret rapture, except in the false concept. There's no secret rapture when Jesus comes. It will be a glorious open rapture. Every eye will see Him. They also that pierced Him. All kindreds of the earth will wail because of Him. What an open glory. 
Oh, don't you long for that day? Coming for His children. Number four, the glory of the reunion. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel into the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That's reunion. That's reunion. You know, I love reunions. I want to tell you, when our niece Carolyn Rimmers and Eugene came over from Lansing, he's assistant treasurer, and their children, I tell you, I just had to give both of them kind of two coon hugs. Reunion. Reunion is a wonderful thing in Jesus, isn't it? When my wife and I were called to be missionaries in the Inter-American Division, they gave us a month to pack and say goodbye to my people and goodbye to her people. And We're living down in Washington area, Washington, D.C., and we went up in New York where my father and mother were to say goodbye to them. And, and as we were there, my father was so happy to think that his youngest son could be a foreign missionary. He was just so happy, he was almost beside himself with joy, and mother was just the opposite. Mother said, it's politics. She said, I don't want you to go. I'll never see you again. Yes, Mother, you'll see us when Jesus comes. That will be reunion day, but she said, I'll never see you till then. The last morning as we knelt in prayer, Father was praying a fervent, beautiful prayer, thanking God, and Mother was crying as though her heart would break. They went out of the car. We were driving a little car down to New York City. She went out and held on to the car. <laughs> and uh, she didn't know she was. And so I thought, we'll hint to her that we have to go. And so I put my foot on the accelerator. You know what happens when you do that. <sighs> she didn't know a thing happened. <laughs> Held right on. <laughs> Finally, we said, Mother, we just have to go. We waved our handkerchiefs. Her tears were so copious. My wife kept waving. We were going around the bend. She said, the last she, they see of us, I want her to see the handkerchief waving. On the way to New York, we went through Philadelphia, where my brother Miles Roy was holding a series. He asked me to sing that. I used to sing a little in those days. I can't anymore, but then I did. Went out and was preparing for the meetings in the hall there. And just about the time the meeting was to start, what do you suppose happened? A door opened, and there was Mother. She'd gotten somebody to take her in their car down to Philadelphia to say goodbye all over again. We all stayed at Miles Roy's place. And the next morning, we had to go through it all over again. Oh, she said, I don't know why you're going. It's politics. No, Mother. It's the Lord. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Let's not forget it. We finally had our farewells, and my wife and I went on to New York City. Adolph Dorn was then the transportation agent on the East Coast. He took us for a flying trip all over New York City. He showed us so many things there, we didn't know anything. Finally took us down the wharf, just as we were ready to, to walk, climb up, up on the gangplank. A little car, chug, 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 comes in. And about, there's Mother. She said, I've got to see where you're going to stay in your stateroom. We took her in the, we took her in the steamer, took her down to the room that had been assigned. She said, I want to see where you're going to eat. I think she almost examined the forks and spoons because Mother was nasty neat. <laughs> she wanted to be sure all the silverware is clean. Then she said, will you sing me a song? And I thought to myself, let's sing a song that will carry with it a little gentle reproof. So we sang a song entitled, I've left all to follow my Savior. Never will I turn back to the world. And I was praying in my heart that Mother would know, the devil didn't send us, Jesus led us there. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. And then the... the, the Gong sounded, all guests had to leave, mother and some other relatives lined the home shore. My wife and I came out on deck, waving the handkerchiefs, mothers, tears just... You wouldn't think a little woman, 90, uh, 93 pounds, could have about five pounds of tears. You know, that's an evangelistic count. <laughs> crying, waving their handkerchiefs, crying. And then we started out into the sea. The home shore faded away. And then we just heard the chug of the motor. 
And then it was our turn to get lonesome, our turn to get lonesome. We went down in our little room and we cried like babies. <laughs> Two baby coons. And we got scared. And we knelt down and we said, Lord, we don't want to go to the mission field as babies. We want to be adults. Help us to forget this terrible, haunting memory of mother's face. And the Lord helped and did it. When we got the mission field two or three days later, we got a, a letter. Mother went back home up in New York State. She retired at night with Father. Father slept like an old general who had just finished the battle and been victorious. And about midnight, Dad heard, heard a terrible cry. Oh, God, give me back my boy! Oh, give me back my boy! And I said, why did they have to write that to us? You know, we didn't even dare to think of reunion for fear it would break our heart. Somebody said, when do you go back? We, we don't know. <laughs> we wouldn't let ourselves think of it. It was too, <laughs> there was too much anguish connected. We stayed six months over time. And then when we boarded the boat, heading for home, then we began to think of reunion. <laughs> oh, man, it was beautiful. We could hardly wait to get back to New York Harbor. We were coming into old, foggy New York Harbor, and somebody said, Statue of Liberty. I said, where? They said, in that direction, but you can't see her yet. There's too much fog. But we will a little later. And I said, I'm going to be the first one to see her. And I kept my eyes fixed, fixed on home. <laughs> fixed on home. Little by little, I saw a faint outline of the Statue of Liberty with extended arms. I kept looking, and by and by it came so clear that I knew it was the Statue of Liberty. I forgot all about dignity. I said, there she is! There she is! And nobody seemed to worry a bit, because everybody wanted to be home. Blessed reunion. When we pulled in close enough to see people along the shore, my wife there out on duck deck, we said, let's see where Dad and Mother are and the other relatives. And my wife said, I think there's Dad, right? And she tried to describe. I said, I believe that's it. And just about the time we're sure it was, we found something in his mouth and we knew it wasn't Dad. So we had to guess again. And we kept looking and looking. And finally we were sure there they were. And when we were sure, you know, we forgot all about dignity. Hi, there we are. Here we are. And everybody else was shouting. Home. Reunion. Home. Jesus is coming again. There will be a glorious reunion. Let's not miss it. Berman Warwick, who was baptized two weeks before we were in Omaha, Nebraska, last April, he said, oh, my mother died praying for me, claiming God's promises for me. Oh, he said, she passed away just a little before I gave my heart to the Lord. He has now become a video evangelist. He reported 40 people baptized following his, his work for a period of time. A few months' time. He said, oh, I wish my mother could have seen that I'd accepted Jesus. Oh, my friends, many of us will go down into the grave if Jesus doesn't hurry. But remember this, God answers prayer. It will be a reunion day, a glorious reunion day. What a day that will be. You know, another glory is the glory of, of being ready. Isaiah 25, 9. It shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We shall be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Won't that be a day? Thousands upon thousands of people looking up into the face of our coming Savior and say, This is our God. We've been waiting for this day. He will save us. In order to say it then, let's say it now. You have forgiven me, Lord. You have redeemed me. Though my sins are scarlet, though I've repeated the same thing again and again, you are still the same, a merciful, kind, loving, forgiving God. Amen? Yes. What a day to be ready. What a day to be ready. We're back home several years when we were called at Dad's bedside. And I stood by his bedside as his eyes were closed in slumber. The funeral was conducted just about a quarter of a mile 
from the little church, that little Lincoln and New Center New York church we told you about before. The funeral was there. Then we went about a quarter of a mile up to the little graveyard. The committal service was conducted and completed. Relatives who had come for some of them from hundreds of miles were now making their way out. And then seven of Father's boys that were still alive, one had passed away, formed a circle around Father's grave with Mother in the circle. And my brother Lester said, let's, let's take hands. Let's join hands around this grave. And he said, let us ask the eldest brother to pray a prayer <clears throat> of consecration in which we will tell the Lord by His redeeming grace, we shall meet Daddy in the resurrection. As we knelt hand in hand, <clears throat> and my brother Clinton was praying, I have conducted many funeral services. But you know, friends, at that moment, I realized the emptiness of life without Jesus Christ. Because I knew a lot of relatives were sleeping in that cemetery who, so far as we know, had died without Christ. And I was thanking the Lord that my dad was willing to confess his sins in family worship and keep his record clear. W.A. Spicer used to say, if you sin in the morning, confess it in the morning. If you sin in the forenoon, confess it at noon, in the forenoon. If you sin in the afternoon, confess it then. Keep ready. <clears throat> we had no question about our Father meeting us in the resurrection. And then the thought kept coming to me. He's just a memory now. He has carried nothing, absolutely nothing with him. And he will take nothing with him to heaven except one thing, character. And it seemed to me the emptiness. You think of men who strive for a little more money or strive for a little recognition and fame, and it's froth. Right? And I said to myself, I quoted a statement of Scripture, let me die the death of the righteous. Let my last end be like his. After the funeral service was over, <clears throat> I took my wife because she'd never seen much of this graveyard before, <clears throat> if any. I took her on to various graves. <clears throat> we read the, the writing on the markers. <clears throat> and I pointed out this was a certain relative of ours. Here was a cousin. Here was my uncle. Here lies my aunt. And so on. And here is Ida lying here. And I shared with my wife a little bit of Ida's experience. Ida was, uh, wore the pants in the home. She was the boss. <clears throat> she was a farmerette. Farmer, farmer what? What's the feminine of farmer? Farmerette? I thought et was a little farmer. <coughs> Farmer S. All right. I'll, we'll, we'll let pass. She would get up at 3.30 3 in the morning, slave out all day, go to bed 10.30, 11.30 at night, sleep about five hours, slaving her life out. Somebody said, Ida, you're working so hard, you're working like a slave. Don't you know that if you save up money, the children usually do what they usually do, that is, they spend it. <clears throat> they'll waste the money you make because unless a person makes it, he doesn't know how it came. Easy come, easy go. She said, listen, if they have as much money in wasting it as I have in saving it, fine. But it wasn't fine. When the doctor told her she had cancer and she was on her deathbed, it wasn't fine. She waved her hands wildly. I'm going where? I'm not ready. 
I said to my wife, you know, it's a wonderful thing to be ready. The Holy Spirit says, Hebrews 3, 7, Today, today, if any man hear his voice, harden not your heart. I hope she did find the Lord. I can't be the judge. But my friends, it's a very delicate matter to postpone our salvation, right? And greedily grasp the world. And there's nothing in the world we can take with us. Nothing. We can't take the money. We cannot take the fame. We're Lord on a level. But we can take Jesus Christ and His character. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The last glory we want to mention tonight is the glory of being ready now. Now. And Hebrews 3, 7 says, today, today, today. You know, I found certain people in my ministry, and I'm sure other ministers here have and other friends, I found people who seemed by the grace of God to come right out of a horrid, backslidden condition into Jesus Christ by saying, today, I can't be stronger by waiting. Jesus isn't stronger by my waiting. He's as strong today as he'll be tomorrow. I can't be any stronger in my own works tomorrow. I just let him come into my heart today. I stand at the door and knock, he says. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I will sup with him and he with me. I think one of the most beautiful experiences, though tragic, that we've ever had in a person being and people being ready now was over in Carson City, Nevada. We'd held a series of meetings there, and there was a man there by the name of Fred and his wife Ruth. Some of you may know them. Ruth had had a very bitter experience. She'd slipped away from the Lord. Fred was perhaps twenty years older than Ruth. But they had been married recently. We had known Fred before. And we had been praying that the Lord would keep him from getting another woman that was eager to get him. <laughs> because we knew that if she got him, he would be got. So we prayed, Lord, help him not to connect with this, with this creature. And when we came to Carson City, sure enough, a beautiful, beautiful lady, tender-hearted, but she'd slipped away from the Lord. She'd blended her life with his. They'd been married. And they were sweethearts, really sweethearts. Fred uh, was a very outstandingly honest man, but he didn't know the Lord too well. He'd heard a lot about different religions. So we were praying in Carson City. And you know, during that week, Ruth found the beautiful love of Jesus and accepted his loving forgiveness and became his child. How? By simply trusting him to forgive and cleanse. It's simple, isn't it? The principle is simple. The devil works hard to make it complicated. But friends, the principle is simple. If you hear my voice, I stand at the door. Come in. I will fellowship you. I'll forgive you. And she accepted. During the same week, bless your heart, Fred found peace and salvation in Jesus Christ. The last Friday, Fred invited us to take dinner with him at the, at the noon hour. But first he was going to take us around to see some places and things. He knew that I was a pebble pup. I was not a rock hound. A rock hound is a scientific person. A pebble pup is, pup is just one who'd like to be. And he took me around, told me where there's gold in those hills. <laughs> kind of impresses you. Five feet of snow over it. Took us around, then took us up to eat. About one o'clock we had a delicious meal. Then he took us up to Reno, to the university where he was attending, and we were going to get some uh, 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 a special type of rocks there, specimen. We got there just about two minutes after it closed. And Ruth said, look, Elder Coon, she said, we'll get it for you next Monday. Don't worry a bit. While we're eating dinner, they put a record on. And it was a whistling, a whistler uh, mimicking uh, birds. And it was beautiful. And I 
without realizing what their reaction would be. I said, oh, I love that. She said, I'll get you the record. I said, I was not in it. Honest, I wasn't. She said, you must have it. I'll get it. You see the type of people? They're around inviting people all over the place to come to church. You'd have thought they were thoroughbred, registered old-timers in Jesus. Full of His love. Friday afternoon, they took me back to my little room. It was one of the very few series that my wife couldn't be with me. They took me back to my room about 6 o'clock. They went back between Carson City and Reno to pick up their aged parents in their 80s. And when we started our song service and I stood up to speak, they weren't there. We noticed there was a little agitation out there in the foyer. We thought we saw her parents or somebody. And... uh, But I didn't think seriously about it. Everything must be all right. And as I finished my sermon, just ready to sit down, the pastor rose and he said, Brothers and sisters, we're sorry to tell you that when Fred and Ruth were on their way back to pick up her parents, a young couple were racing down the highway, had a flat tire, it was head-on, and Ruth was killed instantly. Fred has been rushed to the hospital. After we went over to the mortuary, and Ruth's father, who was a, an outstanding health man, said to the funeral undertaker, he said, I want to see my daughter. The undertaker said, she isn't ready yet. He said, look, I want to see her. He said, she's not ready. He said, I must see her. I want to see if she's dead. So we went in with him. He checked on her ears. He said, she, yes, she's gone. Fred was not seriously ill, but when he heard, seriously hurt, but when he heard that his wife was gone, he lost all hope, and he passed away. But you know, tragic as that was, to me it was beautiful. The part that was beautiful was, that couple didn't wait for another series, they didn't wait for another week, they didn't wait for a later time, they just opened their hearts to Jesus. He said, I'll heal your backsliding. I will love you freely. Mine anger is turned away. They accepted him. He was their Savior. When Jesus comes again, I feel sure that we shall see them face to face as we shall see him. What about you this evening? We're closing our series. Tomorrow morning early, as I stated, we're on our way to the next series of meetings. We crave your prayers. The Lord has been so good. We've been driving these motorhomes for over seven years now. The Lord has been wonderful. I drive that 35-foot motorhome and tow a Datsun car behind it, go down the highway rejoicing and praising the Lord. But this concludes our series. Is there a heart this evening? Who came in without the assurance that Jesus is your Savior? And you'll say, yes, Lord, I'll open my heart. I can't do the works, but you've promised to work in me. You've promised to give me your life. And if you are willing to do the work in my life, I'm willing to let you do it. I surrender my heart to you. I receive you into my life to the best of my knowledge and ability. I'll say, Jesus, come in. Come in with forgiveness and cleansing. I'm just a sinner. And He'll be your Savior. He'll be your Savior right now. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If you were once His child and have slipped away, how about claiming Hosea 14.4? Oh, I love it. It says, I will heal your backsliding. I will love you freely, for my anger's turned away. If this evening, if this evening as others come, if you love the Lord with all your heart, I know that in this area, people don't go very much into the idea of coming to the front. But you know it's not a sin. I'd like to ask a special request tonight, and it would be this. It won't hurt any of us. While others may be coming, do you know it helps a backslider to come to the altar if he knows he's covered by many others coming? Did you know it helps? It's very difficult for a person to make it start walking up the aisle when older people who love the Lord don't cover for Him. Would you be willing to come up 
and by coming up and filling these aisles as near the front as you can to cover the backslider so he won't be singled out, you see, as the sinner for all sinners. And if you want to make a new commitment to meet us in glory land, no matter what the condition is as you came in, will you come to the altar as far as you can as we sing our closing song, My Jesus, I love Thee. I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. Can I have Thou lendest me breath, and say when the death dew lies cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. It may be that someone is standing next to you who would be greatly blessed and find it a little easier to even to step out in the aisle if you did. It would be worth it to help another soul. Amen? Maybe we don't feel our need, but maybe the other soul is timid and lonely. And maybe your gesture will help him. This media was brought to you by Audioverse, a website dedicated to spreading God's word through free sermon audio and much more. If you would like to know more about Audioverse, or if you would like to listen to more sermons, please visit www.audioverse.org.